Welcome to the Cloudless Mind podcast about neuroscience and non-duality. Introducing your host, Paul Smith. Uh, well, welcome everyone to another episode from the Cloudless Mind podcast. Today we got a very special guest from London, uh, Mr. James Cook. Welcome, James. Hi. Hi. Thanks a lot for having me. We, we met uh, thanks to the wonderful uh, YouTube <laughs> channels. <laughs> I think you uh, commented on one of our videos and then I watched some of yours, which I found very interesting. So, so how did you come across our uh, Cloudless Mind podcast? I can't actually, it was one of the most recent episodes, it was called Going Down the Rabbit Hole. Oh yeah, yeah. Where you and Scott, I think you just, um, I love the way that one started with just this idea of seeing what's happening right now, right? We're just seeing what's going to come out and our brains are just doing this talking thing, Yeah. you know, that just is kind of manifesting. I think that's how you, you started uh, that episode. Um, yeah, I, I genuinely, I think it must have just been recommended to me on YouTube based on other things that I liked. I think that must have been how it popped up. Um, and I just left an enthusiastic response of just like this, this is great. And, um, I guess you, you, um, clicked through to my channel from there. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, we true. saw that I was very happy to see that. I mean, I think in another episode you expressed the same point. Yeah. I was, I was very happy to see this other people interested in this intersection between, you know, these certain kind of non-dual ideas in philosophy and modern neuroscience. Yeah. Um, and like there was this feeling of, of excitement cause it's quite a niche thing. But it's kind of mind blowing that it's niche, right? It's like it's to me, it's the most it's the most important thing there is to know about existence, and the most exciting thing, and the most the best thing for your well being and your you know personal growth. But it's seen as somehow quite a niche subject. I, I totally agree upon that. So for our listeners, you are a neuroscientist, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and you're also deeply interested in uh, philosophy and spirituality. You mm -hmm. like to combine all those things. Yeah. Um, to me, it's also very interesting that I see so many people suffering, so many people having stress or uh, struggling with their ego, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, why do you think so little people are willing to look in another direction? Well, so I think the the reason people aren't tending to look, I would say, mm -hmm. people want people want to look. They're willing to look. Yeah. I think. Um, people want a way out of suffering, right? Like we, we all would agree with that. Um, there are psychological, you know, it's, it takes a certain amount of, um, we have defense mechanisms, you know, fears around, around kind of radical change, you know, we evolved to survive. We yes. want things to stay as stable as possible. You know, this is yeah. this idea of home, homeostasis. It like our fun, fundamentally our, us as organisms, we want to keep our physiology. We want to keep our like, you know, heat in a certain range, we want to keep our like everything, we just want to regulate and keep everything safe. And that applies to psychology as well. So if you're gonna, if someone tells you that there's like, a radically different way of being in the world that will relieve your suffering, there's some trepidation, you know, you kind of, people would rather just go go to work as you know, yeah. as normal and um, not engage in this stuff. Um, yeah, especially since it is so it really is like, uh, such a huge deal, you know, and, and that can be that can be a bit, um, scary to to believe that to believe that you could possibly there could be something out there you don't know that really is like you know will yeah. really change your life um but also societally you know it's not um True. good for production in general i think if we all <laughs> no. if we all wake up yeah and, and just are happy <laughs> fully liberated and happy that's not really good so society sends us messages that we probably shouldn't spend too much time <laughs> doing this kind of inner inner growth work i think um and finally <clears throat> Our psychology is entirely, again, as I said, like built around survival. It's not built around knowing the truth. True. So True. our brains, yeah. our brains are really designed to do these tricks to build up these illusions that keep us alive. They're not designed, designed. I say they've not evolved to help us know reality or help us wake up or help us, especially, be liberated from suffering. Right? We're not supposed to be happy animals. We're supposed to be effective animals at surviving. Uh, so true. And I think as our brain wants to save uh, as much energy as possible. Yeah. It just l loves to stick at its routine constantly, but also at its thought patterns. And I mean, if you were living on the savanna in a small group, then it's better to believe what the whole group believes. So you're safe and part of the group for your survival, rather than becoming an annoying philosopher asking <laughs> questions <laughs> about who are you and is there actually yeah. free will and stuff. Well, I also think um, 
my instinct is uh, as I'm trying to I'm trying to um, read more widely in terms of the deep history of this stuff. Yeah. So you know, like Advaita and things that you're familiar with, um, and the more that I see out there of this stuff, the more it seems that most cultures before what we consider the kind of modern Western way of seeing the world, a lot of cultures got this. Yeah, a lot yeah. of cultures have non-dual teachings, right? Like um, there's a book I'm about to read on like kind of Mesoamerican uh, ideas of there being, I think it's called Teotl. It's like this this one great thing, energy, whatever you want to call it, the, the, the or, you know, the stuff of reality that everything is made of and you're part of it. Yeah. And I think when we were living in these small communities, it was easier for people to engage in these ideas you know, because again, we, what are you going to do with your spare time once you've foraged and hunted food? You know, you probably would philosophize and try to, you know, live in a harmonious way with the world instead of the way we're tending to live now, where it's more production focused, I guess. Yeah. And I think it's also more individualistic. So we've yeah. come to the point where uh, from a young age, uh, you start to believe that you are very important uh, <laughs> and, and you do everything to... Uh, extend and improve your image to the outer world through social media yeah. and all that stuff. And but the funny thing is, the m the more and more you are identified, the more suffering uh, you get. Mm. So it seems. What's your opinion about that? Definitely, I, I, you know, I think all suffering plays out through the conceptual machinery of our brains. Yeah. You know, like you have to, if you uh, relax your conceptualizing. Mm -hmm then the state you're in is one where everything just is, right? So, so your brain takes this world that just is and constructs stories about it, constructs concepts, you know, and it's on that level yeah. that suffering happens, you know, where you prefer certain things. And, and so when you say the more identified you get, you're getting very, when that happens, you're getting identified with one particular concept, which is the concept of the self, right? Yeah this we we turn our attention on our whole physiology our whole organism and in quite a clumsy way we draw a line around it and we say that's james that's <laughs> a self you know yeah. and then that's why as soon as you start i say clumsy because as soon as you start to question this you go wait a minute am i my body am i my liver yeah like you see it, it's so it becomes very obvious that like that this was always just a story you know about this very messy process um so that when you when we get you know obsessed with that concept and again, evolution wants us, well, wants us, <laughs> evolution has equipped us to be obsessed with that concept because yeah. all of our ancestors were the unhappy ones who were overly obsessed with survival, you know. It's certain that there would have been organisms that were born, say, fully awakened and just they didn't bother eating and they just dissolved into the rest of the world because they were just happy, you know, <laughs> so it's true. possible just to be happy, but we're not, we're not, those aren't our relatives. <laughs> our relatives are the ones who woke up in the morning and were unhappy and obsessed with, you know, they wanted more food and they wanted more, you know, sex and everything. Yeah. Um, that's our lineage. So it takes some work to break out and see, you know, the way things really are. <laughs> yeah, this is so true because, um, People always say, yeah, but there is only now and there's nothing you need to be fully uh, happy with the present moment because this is all there is. And I'm like, that's so true. But imagine there were two <laughs> animals and one animal is like, oh yeah, everything is exactly as it is. I'm fully satisfied with life as it is. And the other one is like, yeah, this is kind of okay, but let's look, uh, move on yeah, and yeah. see if there's <laughs> more food to get. I mean, which of those two have uh, increased the chances for survival? It's the one yeah. that keeps running. But yeah. it seems we it, now <laughs> live in a, in a time where so many people are running and it, it's so extreme <laughs> when I, it's what I see in business in Holland, 15.9 people of our whole population has got a burnout. We're totally yeah. exhausted. And you see similar things in, in England? Yeah, definitely, absolutely. And I think you're absolutely right that you say that everyone's running. And I think the importance of what you're doing and, and what I'm starting to try to do now is I feel like you and I, even though, so the example you gave of an, org, you know, an organism that just is happy and one that's like unhappy and, you know, going to be more better at surviving, that doesn't say anything about the kind of philosophical, uh, you know, it doesn't mean that the, the truth of the situation, just because the one survives doesn't mean that is, you know, uh, it's untrue that you can just be happy with nothing. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's true. It's just a survival thing. Yeah. But, but you and I, I feel we're not... We're living in this Western world where we're not going off and becoming monks or living in caves and, and just trying to fully 
become enlightened and like you know, settle into the present moment. Um, even though that's a possibility, people can do that. And that's that's psychologically, you know, a reality. Yeah. But I feel like what what I'm trying to do and what I think I see you doing is is trying to tread some middle ground where everybody's running, as you say, and and getting obsessed with these these concepts. And it's just pointing out there's another option. You don't have to fully settle into the now and never do anything again, never eat, never work, you know, but you should just know yeah. that like yeah. there's a there's a break as well as an accelerator. You know, you really can just settle back if you know, even if it's only for ten minutes in the morning with like a meditation practice, you know, just so people know it's an option. Yeah, true. And also for uh, some people they now become aware, some companies even like when I'm relaxed, when my mind is calm, then suddenly creativity increases. So yeah. uh, more and more people start to be open-minded now. Then, then they want more creative ideas to <laughs> sell new yeah. innovative products, get more money. Yeah. That's fine. I mean, that's, it's yeah. the first glimpse of, uh, of uh, looking the other way. Because we're, we're always looking at the outside world, pretending that we as being our solid object and that we mm -hmm. control this being while actually yeah. all these uh, things are assumptions right yeah they're models they're they're yeah there's a single reality and then there are brains that existed to do these tricks of coming up with simulations essentially inside the brain of these concepts and of you know uh things that we call objects and the important thing to know is to, that it is when you see an object, you're seeing of it is like a simulation yeah. running in, on your brain. Yeah. And most people, when they hear that, they 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 don't internalize it fully because it takes it really flips your understanding of reality. Yeah. What what I'm saying here is is not that you're living your life and oh, isn't it interesting to think that when you see a cup, it's kind of a bit ephemeral or ah, it's kind of in your brain. I'm I'm saying the kind of inverse where I'm like, no, no, no. There's a single <laughs> like reality that you are part of where there's full liberation from suffering. Yeah. And usually you're you are fully immersed in a dream. You know, this truly is a dream state um, to believe in the independent existence of these objects, you know. Um, but I, I wanted to say when you um, said about how creativity um, Im improves when you're relaxing, you know, away from this way of conceptualizing, mm -hmm. I feel like, so when I was an undergraduate and I first learned about how intuition works yeah. in the brain, mm -hmm. um, it kind of blew my mind to learn that it's a real thing. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. It's really, um, because our culture kind of, again, tends to, it's almost synonymous with some just imaginative act. Like make, people seem to think it's just making stuff up, essentially intuition, you know, or some something mystical that's, you know, beyond, beyond science. But there's... So I don't know if you're familiar with the cerebellum at the uh, this kind of part of the mm -hmm. brain that's at the back. Yeah. If people look at a picture of the brain from the side, they'll see it looks like a little ball of wool at the back. And most of neuroscience they ignore cerebellum. If you see brain scans, it's usually cut off of the picture. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, because because people tend to historically they've just thought it's to do with movement and like balance and this kind of thing, like riding a bike. You use your cerebellum. But what we're learning now is that the cerebellum is taking information from every single part of the brain. And the same computation that allows you to map all of the rich information that's coming in when you ride a bike to allow you to move your muscles in the pre like you know the precise way to stay on the bike, that's happening all the time. Yeah. When through intuition, you know that's that's most of what we are. And the cerebellum actually has half of the neurons in the brain. Oh wow! And which is kind of crazy that we just ignore it. It's like half of what's going on. <laughs> and so if you're in a flow state and th everything's just working and you can't say why, you know, you've disappeared. Your rational mind is offline. Yeah. Your cortex isn't really isn't doing that much. Isn't getting in the way, yeah. and everything's working and it feels wonderful. That's because you know your cerebellum is allowing reality to flow th through you essentially <laughs> through you know sensation through to action. Oh, that's great. So uh, yeah, I think that that way of being, you know, we all need to be a bit more cerebellar. I think in the way we in the way we live. Well, actually, that's how I often describe it to people. I said, you're so uh, identified with the idea that you are the one doing everything. I said, but at the moments that you're in the zone, that you're in flow, then there's not even self-awareness. There's only the awareness of what is happening, and it all goes spontaneously and automatically, and there's not even this contracted eye sensation involved. And that's actually something everyone can relate to. And also that your suffering at the moment, you're totally engaged in something, it's just gone, because these thoughts don't pop up. Yeah, I feel like when... 
people, the, the times people get the insight that you're referring to, which is essentially an insight of, of no free will. Yeah. You know, there's like, things are just happening. These words are just coming out of my mouth. And we have such a, a kind of intellectual hangover of these, of this obsession with free will from this kind of, I think it probably comes out of Christianity, but I don't know. But, um, that when people entertain the concept of not having free will, it just int introduces such a fear that they uh, they don't see every time you are confronted with your lack of free will, it's an opportunity for this this state we're talking about, where you can actually just fall back into witnessing, fall back into this identification with awareness, yeah. and just because this is what's really happening all the time, <laughs> yeah, right? It's so all obvious. the time, <laughs> exactly all the time. There's the lights are on. There's this witnessing that is not. James, it's just this this aware presence, yeah. and everything is just unfolding. And when you're in that, when you're engaged, when you're in that mode, the unfolding is just the most awe-inspiring thing you've ever seen. You know, like awe is a real thing, right? We all know what it's like to look at a landscape and go, "Wow, that's really yeah. beautiful." And we we tend to, you know, if you look at a leaf, we are so familiar with leaves, we forget that there's as much complexity. And beauty in a leaf, right? That there, as there is in the Grand Canyon, yeah, yeah, yeah. because that's another thing that um, called habituation, which is um, a discovery which won the Nobel Prize a few decades ago. The scientist Eric Kandel, he recorded neurons in a slug, okay, a plesia, and um, essentially just mapped the way that the electrical signals in the in mm -hmm. the neurons how they how they reduce with exposure to a stimulus. So if I if I touch your yeah you know, if you when you put your clothes yeah. on, you feel them immediately. Yeah. And then after a minute, you don't you're not aware. Like I ha until I mentioned it, I wasn't aware yes, of the yes, sensation yes. of cloth on yeah. me, right? And we know that this is very fundamental. It's just the neurons they fire and then they gradually stop firing their adapt. Yeah. But this is so fundamental that we often overlook how important it is because every single cell in your body, every single uh, you know brain cell is based on this principle of adaptation and habituation and essentially taking things for granted and getting overly familiar so with true. things, which is psychologically, you know, all of the neurons that encode every psychological concept you have, whether it's, the, you know, your romantic partner yeah, even, yeah. That, the concept of them is encoded in neurons, which you can guarantee are going to habituate. They're going to <laughs> fire less and less and less, <laughs> unfortunately. And it's important to know that. And if you, so then if you, habituation happens over time. So if you actually do immerse yourself in the present moment and you identify with the witnessing, the habituation drops back and you're confronted with that fresh, you know, witnessing of how astounding everything is, that all this is just happening by itself. Yeah. And so I think that's where the concept of the sacred totally makes sense in terms of human psychology. Yeah. That, and we should have, you know, a way of, I think this is a way to understand what sacredness is um, and awe and beauty and all these things that we want out of life that's not, you know, it's part of science. It's described in terms of uh, neuroscience rather than positing some extra, you know, mystical forces. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating because I think what you see is that the brain gets used to everything. So we look for more and more extremes everywhere mm. in the world. So we need the bigger car, the, the more beautiful uh, girlfriend. We need to watch more extreme porn, have more <laughs> extreme food. That we try to get that same sensation back, which hardly ever happens. Then your, your neurons are adapting, and you're just trying to bump them back up uh, with a fresh stimulus instead of yeah. uh, instead of engaging directly and stopping them from getting habituated. I guess true. And this is sometimes I can when I'm with a group for two hours talking about this stuff, and sometimes at the end the minds all become so calm that that sensation mm. is like wow it, it's for most people would describe it as bliss but it's fresh again do you do you find people people respond like people who are not familiar with these ideas if you're in a room of people and you're you're trying to convey this do you do you get the feeling people um occasionally so normally in businesses i don't go as deep as this i do go as deep as but they never draw the conclusion and i say okay it's the unconscious brain that's actually processing everything and your awareness has a slight delay so afterwards you become aware it's even now that my awareness becomes aware of these words after the unconscious part of the brain has has said them so and then i say so Absolutely. also when someone buys something it's the unconscious brain that makes a choice and then your approximately 60 bits per seconds yeah. of awareness comes up with a story about why. <laughs> so I go as deep as that and <laughs> rarely I go, but, but who is this I that is actually making the choice? Because for, for most people, this is like such 
shock. I don't. I mean, I'm, they hire me to also entertain the audience, so <laughs> I don't want to leave. <laughs> no, you no. don't want to blow their minds too much. <laughs> I would love to do an extra podcast with you. We're at 20 minutes now, so let's. Uh, if you still got time. Mm. Perfect, perfect. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, I'm going to end this first episode with James Cook. Thanks, James, and uh, we'll be right back.